Levin. I'm an architect, Levin and Associates Architects. I've been practicing for almost 40 years. You'd never know, I'm sure. Um, so I'm, I'm really privileged to be here with this extraordinary panel. Uh, we're going to talk about sustainability in green buildings, but we're going to talk about it in the terms of building materials and innovation. Um, sustainability in green buildings have already are now really well reflected in our codes and in our expectations from our clients and our projects. But smarter buildings require smarter choices in materials, and we're looking for new innovations as we use them to build our new buildings and how developers can reap the benefits of environmentally thoughtful construction methods and materials. So some of the topics that we're going to talk about today with my wonderful panel, and I'll introduce them in a minute. What is cutting edge sustainability? Why would a real estate company have an innovation lab? Why is the construction industry so slow to innovate? And why does connecting people to nature bolster resilience? So to join me today on the panel, and I'm going to introduce all of them, and you can read their extensive bios in the program, but by quick introduction, Susan Klein to my left is the director of the Department of Public Works for the city of Santa Monica. She oversees Santa Monica's approach to staying on the cutting edge, cultivating creativity, and fostering streamlined collaboration among divisions, departments, and other municipalities. Susan will be talking primarily about the public sector. Next is Michelle Sullivan on the left. Michelle is a principal at the Landscape Architecture Studio MLA. She has focused on ecologically and culturally sensitive design in her three decades of landscape architecture. And her broad strength is in understanding the design with specific knowledge in horticulture, materials, and construction. She's collaborated on uh, Dodger Stadium, the County Natural History Museum, and UCLA's Mildred Mathias Botanical Garden. Michelle's work focuses on connecting the public to the natural environment. Next is Sarah Neff, Senior Vice President for Sustainability at Kilroy Realty Corporation. Sarah took Kilroy from having no sustainability program to be named the number one office real estate company on sustainability in North America. At, at Kilroy, she oversees all sustainability initiatives for existing and development portfolios. And her real claim to fame, and uh, what she'll be talking about today, is the launch of Kilroy's Innovation Lab and its green award-winning green leasing program. And certainly, last but not least, is Eric Corey Freed. He identifies himself as a sustainability disruptor, so we're counting on him to work his magic on this panel. He's an award-winning architect, author, global speaker. He is the disruptor for Morrison Hirschfield, and he identifies solutions to problems most teams didn't know were holding them back. He's also founding principal of Organic Architect and a visionary design leader in biophilic and re regenerative design. So please welcome my panel on uh, <laughs> building materials in livable cities. And I'm going to ask Susan Klein to start City of Santa Monica. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here today. So I'm uh, the resident bureaucrat and public works nuts and bolts person on the panel, so it's only gonna get better from here. Um, but I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the really cutting edge stuff that the public sector is actually leading the way on. So what is di what's different about what we're doing in Santa Monica as a municipal owner is that we're using our design and construction of city funded projects to create the way for, to create pathways for the private sector. So um, why are we doing this? <laughs> why, why are we making the investment? Well, uh, the city council in Santa Monica 
is, has been a leader in sustainability for decades, and they just have a little laundry list for staff to accomplish over the next few decades. So uh, we, we really need to be out in front of how to implement, how to make sustainability happen. So, but still, again, Santa Monica uh, is only eight square miles, 90,000 people, uh, why care, right? So our council and our city leadership likes to take the, the, the big picture. This is uh, some data from the Pew Research Foundation, they, Pew Research Center, that was released in 2015. And the darker the orange, the more skeptics there are for climate change. The darker the green, the more the believers in climate change. So as you can see in the US, we still have a lot of skeptics in 2015. And then for those who need numbers, uh, this makes it quite clear that we have a lot more work to do in the US. Um, those who are, uh, the US is not quite convinced that climate change is a very serious problem or that we should be concerned that climate change will harm individuals personally. People just don't believe that it's gonna reach climate change impacts are gonna affect them. And in the US in 2015, it was only 30% who thought that they would actually be touched by climate change. Um, that's at least where, we're at, where we were at before fall of 2016. Maybe we have a few more believers today. Um, however, the drought did top clim climate change concerns across all regions, so now at least we're finding some common ground. Uh, even though I will focus on water, um, there is clearly an intersection between energy and water. Uh, across the U.S., 4% of total electric use is for water and wastewater sectors, and here in California, it's 19%. Um, of energy use across the state that's used for water, wastewater. So what is Santa Monica doing to address global concerns at a local level beyond policy? Um, so uh, council has given us direction to pursue living building challenge on one of our uh, larger projects called the city services building, where it's a 50,000 square foot addition to our historic city hall you can see it's behind the city hall on the top of the slide with the solar panels on top. Um, let's see. To achieve LBC certification, Living Building Challenge, which is the most, um, I would suggest, and I think Eric might back me up on this, it's uh, the most aggressive sustainability metric that we could use. Uh, we have to achieve three imperatives, net zero water, net zero, zero energy, and red list compliance. Our NZE strategy is pretty straightforward and largely driven by load reductions and solar uh, on-site generation. But the in intersection between our energy and water strategies is on the roof, impacting approval of our rainwater to potable system. So the project is now under construction, but we're still working with the county and the state um, Department of Drinking Water to resolve <laughs> issues around the source of water. So we're still struggling to get approvals from rainwater that touches glass, that doesn't have the, what we're hearing is the required NSF certification. There are rubber gaskets that are connecting uh, the solar panels on the roof to their infrastructure. And even though we've done studies, we've invested the time and the money to prove that the uh, rainwater sourced off of these solar panels at the end of the day when it goes through our on-site reverse osmosis system will meet drinking water standards. We're still working on getting those approvals, which is, is pretty mind-blowing, but it'd be great if the private sector could help us out uh, in finding some solutions to these materials and getting proper certifications. So we're actively coordinating with each agency to ensure that the design and installation of the systems are safe and effective uh, methods for all systems in the building, including our composting toilets. So our net zero water strategy, which of course is a challenge in our region, is com primarily composed of rainwater to potable, composting toilets, 
and an on-site well water for extreme drought conditions, which may be the new normal, um, but, but we do have that as a, as a backup only. Um, the composting toilets will save over a quarter of a million gallons of water a year, and if it wasn't for the composting toilet system, honestly, for this size of a building, 50,000 square foot, three-story class A office space, we wouldn't reach NZW. So this will sh the next two slides will demonstrate that. The monthly water budget is shown here. So um, you can see that we're about 30,000 gallons. And um, the red bar on top is for part of LBC requires um, urban agricultural elements. So that's what the red bar is. The yellow is for toilets and showers. And then the blue bars on the bottom are gray water, rainwater. Those are all our on-site sources. So this is our water budget with code compliant toilets uh, where we started. And this is where we're at today. So composting to without composting toilets, there's no way we'd be able to achieve this. So everybody freaks out about composting toilets because we've all, we all love our national parks and we've probably been to a couple. It, that's t so <laughs> that's not what we're putting in um, to City Hall in Santa Monica. This is just a, a quick picture of a composting toilet. It should look very familiar from what you see in your offices today. Um, but it, and, and the composting toilets are really, this is an entirely approved system. It was extremely painful. It took us about two and a half years and required a lot of staff time that I know the, the public sector just would not endure to pave the way to make this happen. So that's where we're, we're really, as a public agency, um, as a regulatory body, we're trying to break down the regulatory barriers to, en to enable these kinds of innovations. So I think that's a great place to end. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Uh, Michelle. So we're going to switch to landscape in between uh, building uh, presentations. toilets approved and as Susan said no private sector developer is probably going to spend that kind of money uh, or that period of time because time is money and that's more the challenge most likely um, so Michelle are you ready yeah you know, I have to say that I was looking forward to I really wanted to hear more about it so I think that was a good opportunity <laughs> you know, obviously you know we're in Los Angeles and we're in the Mediterranean area and with climate change there are so many challenges that we have you know, what, limited water, more heat, uh, just really our landscapes are very uh, under stress. And so we look to the other Mediterranean biomes in the Mediterranean region and in, in South, uh, South Africa and the Cape and Australia and Chile to learn so much from them. 
And we also are going more south to Baja and the Sonoma Desert to expand our plant palettes where we can't use natives. Um, I have recently finished the LA Federal Courthouse building over there on First Street. In that case, we use native plants in, a, in an urban setting to really expand and ha create habitat down into the, into the city. Very important for us to connect people with the nature in their city. Now, I have um, also been interested in other work around the globe, and one of them is Kazu Sager's work in the uh, the Hotel Tierra Patagonia, where she used the poetry of wind to create the building shape in terms of that and create a setting that was very much into the landscape or the natural landscape protecting it, as well as Myung King's Alexander Art Plaza in the West Palm Beach. In this case, on the lower slides, using indigenous uh, stone, she has laminated it to create not only an artful piece that engages the public, but also creates a diversion for stormwater. So here it is, this art, this poetic motion in terms of a place. So we uh, look at also, uh, we look at Simona Belize's work over in using of the bamboo and using, for example, the Ziri Pavilion over in Hanover, uh, Germany, as well as the Crosswater Bridge to innovate us and also to create an energy and to inspire us in terms of materials and how they're used and how these vegetative steel can be used in construction motion. Now, Mark van Villet had created a beautiful piece in the Dutch flatlands, uh, in, in the sand, uh, excuse me, in the flat sands, where it is a diurnal motion. It's an art piece that through the tide, it changes, the experience changes. I really encourage you to look at a video online so you can see that as well as a solstice register. So here's a beautiful way to engage the public in the nature and the landscape and the land in artistic ways. Now, over, I, I have to use the example of just downtown LA with Morphosis and Caltrans and the headquarters down there. This is an, a beautiful way of integrating solar panels so that they're really part of the architecture, not plopped on. I just think that, what I love about it is the fact that there is the skin on the east and west side that acts for shading that changes during the day. And you're starting to see that in the works that I'm showing you, that a lot of it has to do with this registration of time during the day and how, the bod how these projects function within that, most functionally and artistically. And this was also done by Nikola Basics in, uh, in Croatia in this solar panel exhibit that he's put on. It's, it's 22 uh, meter diameter, a beautiful use of collecting light during the day for an interactive, engaging piece in the evening times, which also powers a lot of the energy for the waterfront. I think it's a, a beautiful example. And this one is down in Encinitas. This is Grow Green Agriculture by the gentleman that figured this out in his dorm that wanted to bring this uh, under like two acres of land. And he is creating most of the microgreens for restaurants in the LA area. So I think he uses, with that, he collects all his 100% of rainwater. And he also uh, uses about a third of the land that you would don't normally do in regular agriculture. And so in, at our office at Studio MLA, we, are, we do a lot of guerrilla work planning, and Brenda knows about this, and we look at ter in terms of, for example, uh, green corridor and the clean tech corridor. We, we looked at, at land that had, had industry that was shuttered, as well as lack of connection between the east and the center of LA, and we looked at how we could integrate a different green corridor, taking these ideas that I've shared with you, and we've looked at them in terms of systems, in terms of water, energy, uh, photovoltaic, phytoremediation, to make these a greener city in connection. That's my very short, brief <laughs> presentation for you. Thank you. Sarah. Righto. Try to find my presentation and So I think what was interesting about, about Michelle's your... presentation, just tell me when you're ready, yeah. um, is the integration of the art pieces in the 
practice of sustainability uh, yeah. and the opportunities that we all have to think about that as not just an augmented piece of art that sits in a plaza somewhere, but that it actually right. does something and that it, it contributes to uh, the, uh, the, the practice of sustainability. Sarah. Uh, hi. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, we're talking about sort of the future of the built environment, and we're, we've heard a lot about what we hope the public sector can accomplish, and I think this is the, like the greatest, most sustainable public sector project ever. We've seen a lot about great materials and sort of the future of building materials is those that adapt to the environment during the day. Um, I'm going to talk about something a little more boring, which is the fact um, that there's a secret at this conference that we have not, we've not, we've not talked about because we're ashamed. And the secret is that we've talked a lot about, we've heard from a lot of utility people about how, and about how California is awesome and innovation and technology is all coming from here. People flew in, they want to see what we're doing. And that's all great, except real estate hates it. Um, we hate it. We, um, I work in real estate um, and we, we hate it. Um, and I am going to solve that problem. We at Kilroy are going to solve that problem. Um, and uh, we hate it for a number of reasons. Um, we, energy efficiency is hard. Most of our leases are not written to allow us to recover that capital. Um, everybody's eyes are going to immediately glaze over. I can start talking about urinals again, but I want to get to the leases. Um, unless your leases are written in such a way that you can recover your capital investments um, over the payback period, it's going to be really, really hard to do anything with energy efficiency. And the problem with an innovative project is that the payback period is super hard to calculate. So, and engineers don't understand it, it's difficult, um, it's hard to do the measurement and verification. Um, the, it's all over the map in terms of great stuff that's coming out of, you know, NREL and all the great stuff we heard about yesterday, and then just terrible crap. Um, and it all gets pitched to you by people who wear equally nice suits. Um, and it's very hard to tell what's good and what's not. Um, and that is really stymieing um, the ability of good technology to get into real estate to change it. Real estate. 40% of carbon emissions. Um, it's without solving real estate, we're not going to solve anything. Um, and I'm going to try to fix that. And I wanted to fix that by starting the Kilroy Innovation Lab. Here was my inspiration for this. I was at a conference of way even more white men than this conference. Um, it was in, um, it was in, and look at this panel, by the way. I love this. Like Eric is like minority, and we stuck him in the corner. Um, uh, it was in Chicago, it was NAOP, and there was a guy uh, from the National Association of Realtors, the brokers, and he was there and he was talking about the fact that the National Association of Realtors has an innovation lab, and if anybody wanted to follow him back to the office after the panel, he would show it to them, and like a puppy, I was like, yeah, I'm going to follow you home. Um, and they have one. The brokers have an innovation lab. This is it. Um, it's a real lab. They have this adorable manifesto about under us all is the land. And they have all this cool stuff. Um, this is a, a artwork that changes color based on air quality. Um, they're really cool stuff. And I was like, well, if the brokers can have an innovation lab, I want an innovation lab. Um, and so I did. So, um, and do I have an actual lab? I will answer this question, no. The entire Killary portfolio is the lab. What the lab is is the rules of engagement. One of the things I heard earlier on a fantastic panel on transit is that cities need principles of engagement for autonomous vehicles. We were talking about that. And having rules of engagement is really how things are going to afford. So these were my rules of engagement. And my goal with this lab is to get great technologies into my buildings, to have really formalized process for measurement and verification, to scale the good stuff quickly, also to not deal with the people in suits, to have people I trust more uh, to tell me which are the good stuff, um, and to move on. So this is the Kilroy Innovation Lab. It is this manifesto. Um, just talking about the fact that we piloted stuff for years. Some of it's gone great, some of it's gone terribly, um, and I want to have more good stuff to spur change. Um, and, uh, and so, so here's what we do. Talk about my areas of interest. So if you're not pitching to me in one of these things, I don't want to really talk to you right now. Um, I'll talk to you later. Um, so I love biodiversity. We've been talking a lot about that. Um, I had a beehive. All my bees died last week. Um, so we can pour out 60,000 little drinks for my homies um, later today. Um, but we piloted, it was actually great, and the tenants loved it. Um, and so here's what I've um, really been interested in. But here's the most important thing. It's here's, here's what it is to work with me. Um, I want utilities to collaborate with me. Um, and I want people, and this is like, you would think basic stuff. Like, do you have insurance? 
Are you UL listed if you're plugging something in? Or do you have lawyers? Are you focused on the right areas? Do you know what your payback period is? That kind of thing. Um, and so we talk about the areas that we're interested in. Um, the great thing about that is that immediately people have wanted to partner with us. Um, so Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator came on as our first partner. Um, so we've had all of our kickoff meetings, um, and this is what they look like. They're all fancy. Um, and uh, we're going to just start, we're going to, you know, they have their portfolio of technologies. We're going to start that coming in. There's other um, groups that I'm really excited about getting technologies. And I want to talk to you about my, my overall vision, which is it doesn't have to be this bad anymore, guys. It's not going to be this bad. Um, we're going to get real estate to realize that instead of just going like, leave us alone, which is our current sort of mentality, um, that we're going to be proactive on what we want. Pilots will be less scary. We'll really get to scale great technology. Um, so my goal is to eventually create a consortium of innovation labs across a lot of real estate firms. And the idea is when great technology comes through trusted channels, like our utilities, like the California Energy Commission, like the Clean Tech Incubator and others, that we have a quick way to deploy, you know, is this the right technology for a high rise? Is it for mid rise? Is it suburban, city? What are we talking about? Which are the companies interested in that kind of thing? Um, let, me, let me plug you into these places and get that done faster as opposed to who can come pitch to me after a conference. Um, and that's the way that we're gonna create really, really rapid change in an industry that, because of lease structure and other things, has been pretty resilient, pretty resistant to it. Um, also resilient, I guess that means the same thing. Um, so um, that's just the short on Innovation Labs and why I'm super excited about it and how I hope it changes the future of real estate. Thank you. Certainly, uh, last but not least, Eric. Eric made us swear that we wouldn't put anybody after him. Right. <laughs> so be prepared. That's the way I like it. Got it? So start thinking of your questions for our panel. We're going to have a little discussion after Eric's presentation, but then we'd like to open it up to your questions because I'm sure you have many. Oh, you all want innovation labs. I'm totally convinced. And want to work with the city of Santa Monica. <laughs> so let's talk urinals. We're rating. There's this joke that I'll never go a professional day in my life without talking about urinals at least once. We're all hybrid waterless urinals now. So that's yeah. our new thing. Yeah. We're also uh, gender neutral. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then also uh, you have to have your all gender restroom. Yeah. So that's the other. Yeah. So that's a great new opportunity for even a larger yeah. bathroom. Should we, have, should we take a question? Or yeah. <clears throat> Ready? Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. You know, it's funny, I didn't think I'd start the day as a pioneer, but I'm really glad to see white men are finally getting represented <laughs> at these panels. Let's see if it appears here. Hey, there it is. All right, sorry, we had some technical difficulties. Huh? Yeah, urinals. So urinals. How many have put... Uh, uh, urinals, uh, what are they called? The what? ones with the uh, cartridges, waterless yeah. urinals in their buildings. Tilray is yeah. the waterless urinal pioneer. Yeah. And because America. of code or because of uh, driven by your client, tenant, lease? Ready. You ready? Yeah. Okay, we'll give up on the urinals. I was just riveted listening I to you. I know, it's fascinating. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, um, I don't know if you realize it, but we're totally effed. We're totally screwed. Over the last decade, essentially, CO2 levels have risen 20 parts per million. Another billion people have joined us on this already crowded planet, and a quarter of them have moved into urban areas, which is really annoying, all while the global temperatures increased by half a degree centigrade. Essentially, now we're at the point, those of us working in climate science, it's not a matter of solving climate change. There is no solution. It's basically how bad do you want it to be. We're now kind of quantifying how to mitigate at least some of the risk. Is it going to be between one and a half or two degrees? Essentially, dealing with climate science, well, it's kind of like going to Taco Bell. It's like, you're going to get diarrhea, but how much diarrhea do you want to get, basically? <laughs> like, if you want a lot, then just keep doing what you're doing. And what's weird about it is, is that the entire world is in need of a redesign. Like, we're not very good at this. And yet, most of the industry is desperately clutching to how we build buildings. And I'm continuously shocked. Why, isn't, why aren't more and more people jumping at the chance to redesign everything? Because 
It's bad out there, folks. I ordered bubble wrap on the internet, and they sent it to me wrapped in bubble wrap. Do you see what I'm saying? Like nobody, nobody's thinking these things through. And these systems fail all the time. They don't work. That's a urinal, in case you're wondering. You're welcome. And we're spending too much time really designing all of the wrong things. Somebody carefully designed this beautiful sidewalk by a freeway that nobody's going to walk on. And they did their pretty little curves in AutoCAD, I'm sure. They probably did a Revit model, for all we know, for nobody. So we're wasting time. And the way we build buildings is stupid. We've been using the same technology for 200 years. No other industry uses the same technology for 200 years. This is a building in 1918. This is today. It's the exact same. <laughs> technology. I would show you one from 1818, but they didn't invent cameras yet. You see what I'm saying? If we need innovation, oh, they really they like that joke. If we, if we need innovation, it's not going to come from within the industry. It's going to come from without. No candle manufacturer invented a light bulb. Oh, it's doubling up. The post office did not invent email. If you want to disrupt this industry, it's not going to come from the, no offense, you, you guys, it's going to come from some forces outside of it. And so what we need to do is start questioning all of these assumptions that we automatically bring to a building. Like assumptions like every building must have air conditioning. That's not necessarily true. Or every building must have drywall. That's certainly not true. Or every building needs to have a utility bill. Or needs to flush clean drinking water down the, down the thing. Or the fact that every building needs to have parking lots. And we've been relying on these same assumptions for all of modern development. You could even extrapolate those assumptions further and say, maybe not all buildings need to have sick employees. Maybe we can start to mitigate some of those outcomes. So I start to question all of these assumptions. That's really my job. I go into meetings and go, why do we need air conditioning? And they go, shut up, hippie. And I go, no, well, seriously, let's talk about it. This is uh, Robert Boyle. He was a scientist. Uh, he's most notably famous for inventing Boyle's Law. It's essentially the idea of what gives us air conditioning. You could say that his principles invented air conditioning. And 300 years ago, he made a list of problems that mankind needs to solve. And they were amazing. And he did it 300 years ago. Like prolongation of life, man flying through the air. 300 years ago, that seemed like bold, visionary stuff. And all of his predictions have come true. It's really kind of wild. Doubling our lifespan, man flying through the air, surviving underwater, transplanting organs, accelerating farming. And then uh, uh, glass that was malleable and colorful. He even came up with a way of, you know, this idea that we needed perpetual light 300 years ago before anybody even did it. He even had this idea for scratch and sniff. I kid you not. He called it varnishes perfumable by rubbing. But it's scratch and sniff. He, 300 years ago. So it, it, it raised this question in my head of what are the problems we need to be solving today? And so I made a list. And I actually, given all the smart people in the room, I'm curious to see what, what, do you, what would you add to that list? What are the problems that mankind needs to solve in the next 300 years? What would come to mind? And I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Climate, climate what, we already have climate change. What, what about it? Oh, solving climate change, yes. Cure for cancer. Cure for cancer. What else? You can shout, Andy. Andy's on the right track, exactly. So I made this list, and this was kind of back of envelope type of stuff, but my first five were essentially all zeros. Zero hunger, zero homelessness, zero drought, zero carbon, zero waste. I thought those are nice, clean lines. And then my next five are a little different. Redefining whatever the hell this democracy thing is that we're experimenting with right now. Free energy for everybody, free storage for everybody, growing organs, and then I added one more just because I'm uh, selfish, growing buildings. And so for the last two years, that's what I've been working on, this idea that we've been growing buildings. The XPRIZE Foundation asked me to come up with what needs to be invented to solve healthy buildings. So that's what we came up with, that we were going to grow buildings using biology. And we call it prostruction. And prostruction is the opposite of construction. That's the idea behind it. Because con is bad and pro is good, right? And so it's the idea that we would grow, literally grow buildings. And what's making it all possible is DNA, that for the first time ever, human beings can cheaply and easily catalog, edit, replicate, and replace DNA. And nature has a wealth of these technologies that we can tap into. And in fact, we expect that the winning team that solves this prostruction issue will be some hybrid plant mixed with bacteria mixed with fungus. And if you start to think in terms of those lines, of those problems that we solve, you start to see the benefits. That in construction, carbon is used as a waste product, but prostruction uses it as a building block. 
And it really shifts that paradigm from traditional cut, slash, and burn to grow, regenerate, and breathe. And so that's really what I'm excited about. And really, now I've dedicated myself to those 10 problems of trying to really work in all 10. I'm up to six so far, but I'm, I'm not doing anything with food yet. But it's, it's an interesting way to kind of frame your work and your impact in your life. And if any of you are interested, I'm happy to talk to you about it further. Um, or screw you, I don't care. Uh, but if you want to watch more about this, there's a TED Talk you can watch. I'm not going to bore you with it. Um, uh, I hate my voice, so I can't. I've never been able to watch it. But this is really the vision of what the American dream could look like for the 21st century, for everybody. Really redefining what victory could look like for everybody. With that, thank you very much. Okay. So you've heard from the public sector, the private sector, the disruptor, the landscape, architect, artist. Um, I'd like to ask each of you to just talk a bit, a little bit about within your own field, the innovation, landscape, public sector. For, Sa for Susan, why is Santa Monica so successful in being able to innovate? What is it about, besides money in Santa Monica, what is it about Santa Monica that allows it to be the example that we all strive to replicate? And is that true? Should we? Uh, so, yeah, we, I often get kind of an eye roll because I'm currently working for the city of Santa Monica and we have plenty of resources, plenty of money to do all this stuff. Um, but that's really not our uh, driver to be successful at doing all of this stuff. It's the first place I've worked where I've been told to do this, get it done. I've worked for very large billion dollar bond programs. We were not <laughs> cash poor. And we did some really innovative stuff, but it was a real struggle. I think it all comes down to leadership. I'm not Pollyannish. I, I like to get stuff done. That's why I'm in this business. So if, if I could, if anyone would take something away, it's that you can make this happen if you are a sole proprietor, if you have a staff of 10, 20, 100, 1,000, um, it's all about you setting that tone. It's about setting the goal and backing your team up to get it done. It, without the leadership, it's not gonna happen. And even if you have less resources, you can get it done to some degree. And you could be known for that, that innovation um, as long as you're leading the way. So Sarah's obviously leading the way in the real estate industry, and she's tackling the entire goddamn thing uh, with uh, of this notion of <laughs> innovation labs throughout the industry. So talk about the challenges that you face or the enthusiastic response that you're getting. Well, it's like kind of samesies, right? So John Kilroy, uh, you know, loves I mean, I, I'm, the, I'm the luckiest because I have a CEO who truly loves the environment. Um, why do? Why did he not care about wireless urinals? He like spends a lot of time on boats, like, like classic rich people do, and um, and like toilets are weird on boats. And he's like, I, it's fine. Um, so it's um, uh, it's 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 very much in the DNA of the company. The other thing is we have tech tenants who. Um, not all of our tenants are tech tenants. We have these other very big tech tenants, you know, Salesforce, Dropbox, Google, um, LinkedIn, and all them, um, who will pay a gobs of money for a building like this. So, you know, when we built a building for Dropbox, uh, we had some bricks that were grown by algae at room temperature, and Dropbox thought that was great. Um, you know, if I built, uh, you know, nail, you know, strip malls in Nebraska, that probably wouldn't be the case. So, I have a lot of market forces in my favor. However, I think that just has to spur me and people who are lucky enough to be in my place in the market to, to just go as far as we can go um, because at least then it sets you know where things can can possibly get to so um, I feel for my brothers and sisters who have my job at companies would have, would have that have much more difficult um, you know market dynamics than I do um, and and like you know those of us who get to be in front have to you know really have to not let ourselves be like oh I did a lighting retrofit congrats me <laughs> um, you really have to push yourself farther because otherwise things don't get done that's great so Michelle I 
I just want to say that what's interesting is that we're a time of, for landscape architecture where it's really tough because of the, the climate dynamics that directly affect our work. At the same time, I think there's a lot of, of excitement in terms of the change. Never have I seen uh, the, all the public be so engaged in the landscape. I mean, I think the, when we had the, we still have the drought, but when the drought was very severe before the last rain, everybody really had a change in terms of how they wanted to respond. Some not so good in terms of their response, but now I think we're right for that change to happen. So I'm, I'm very encouraged the fact that everybody's so engaged and they're really understanding that the relationship that landscape has to nature and how that has to be integrated in the city. So I, I see that. Yeah. Eric, can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the slow speed of change within the construction industry and how you see uh, our ability as innovators, hopefully in the built environment, uh, helping to move that along a bit uh, so that we don't see the same slide in the next five years of the replicative <laughs> building? Um, boy, I got the hard question. Uh, we as an industry, by definition, are risk adverse. A large part of the jobs of many of the people in here is to mitigate risk. So it's baked into how we do things. And then um, you combine that with the length of these projects, you know, anywhere from one to five years. And then you combine that with the developer model where they want to build it as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible. And you basically set up the entire recipe for, for where we are today. So. Um, what I've seen work is, is when we can incentivize it in the other direction. So saying to a school, hey, we'll put solar panels on your building for free. You just agree to buy the power from us at a fixed rate for 20 years, and everybody wins. They get clean renewable energy. They get also a low energy rate, and then investors get a return on their investment. I, I think that model is great. Uh, when it comes to developers, you need essentially a, you know, developers that are open-minded or public-private partnerships like Santa Monica. Right. Santa Monica is, by the way, not that rich. So it, it really did come from, you know, compared to other cities, it really did come from the top of them saying sure. we want to do this. They will have the greenest city hall in the, probably the world when they're done. And, uh, you know, that's pretty impressive. Yes. When I was at Living Future uh, and the Bullet Center opened, the, the biggest achievement about the Bullet Center wasn't the composting toilets or the solar array. The biggest achievement was that it, that it was done at all, that it just existed. And the fact that it was done, it set a precedent that sent a message throughout the entire industry. I had people as far away as Miami saying that because that building exists, we now can pursue mm -hmm. a net zero energy project or a living building challenge project. So it was, it was exciting to see. But people are scared of change. They're scared of innovation. But if you take our market, using the same technology for 200 years, productivity in construction has gone down, labor rates have gone up, and material rates have skyrocketed, it's no wonder that our business model is failing. And so that's what's ultimately gonna drive innovation is, is you know, why aren't more robots building buildings than you know, big guys with no neck that you're paying $33 an hour to? Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. That's the whole problem, right? And, and Eric talked about risk. Um, the whole point with the Innovation Lab is to de-risk innovation for real estate via partnering with trusted institutions. Um, because some are fantastic and some are terrible. Um, and some are great, but they didn't have the finance. I mean, like, whether the tech, I, I hate saying this, but like whether the technology works is like seventh on my list of what makes a successful pilot. Like, do you understand real estate? Do you know how a lease works? Do you know how the utility incentives work? Do you have a good legal team? Do you, and, like, and like down here is what is the product and does it work? Um, and so there's so much that I'm trying to, you know, get rid of the first six items. We can actually focus on the technology um, because there's a lot of really, really great, fun, cool stuff out there, but there's also just a lot of the energy efficiency version of snake oil, you know, and, and we field both. Yeah, I would say for, for us, when we were researching, you know, building systems for this project, and we're also uh, renovating our city yards, 
I was impressed at the technologies that are, I mean, composting toilets is an ancient technology. <laughs> we kind of been doing it forever. So I, I was taken aback at how advanced these systems had become. Um, where we're struggling is on the approvals side of things. Sure. So it's, you know, the Department of Health, talk about being risk averse, the Department of Health, right? The county is really concerned about approving these systems because they're there to safeguard all of us from getting sick and dying and having painful, more painful lives than we're currently living. So it's really working with those regulatory bodies who are never come to these things, right? We need to figure out a way, and I keep pushing USGBC on it, like we need to bring building officials into the fold. They need to be, help us be problem solvers around this. Rating system, I mean, anything for uh, manu materials manufacturers, private sector folks, get your stuff certified it's like fifty thousand dollars but you got it or i think you know upwards to a hundred and twenty thousand dollars to get it certified so it could be used around the world just do it so that when we're you know breaking ground we aren't you know scratching our heads and trying to get a side letter agreement so that we can get you know uh, a gasket approved um to, to meet net zero water risk averse uh code compliance agencies. Anybody else? Yes. Um, I'm just curious. So, so it seems like we need over a decade of a global GD policy that's been sustainable to the nation in conversation. But going forward, do you think that that is prohibiting innovation because they are such restrictive guidelines to achieving certification or these materials for their establishment? Well, there's two answers to that question. There's the answer that I give when I'm filled in a room full of diehard lead nerds. And then there's in front of the general public that is like dipping their foot in the lead pool. So I'm going to give you the latter, which is uh, certifications serve a great purpose in setting a benchmark for blah, blah, blah. You've heard that speech before. But no, lead is nowhere near going far enough, and codes are outpacing lead at an alarming rate, especially here in California. I can now easily see a day that lead is obsolete because it, it has been outpaced by innovation itself. Um, in two years, California switches to their net zero energy standard, and Santa Monica is the first one on board to adopt it, and you're going to see hundreds of cities do it as well. And what are we going to need lead for at that point other than adding more paperwork and complexity to the job? Now, it's not idea. I mean, what I like about lead is that it's also forcing uh, building, buildings developers to address things they normally wouldn't, like health or indoor air quality or water because they tend to fixate on energy. But um, LEED is going to have to innovate faster. And internally at USGBC, those of us that are deep into it have been fighting with them about creating like a carbon standard or embodied energy standard that could be like a LEED plus or something. Yeah, I, I say this as somebody who is on the USGBC National Advisory Council. I hold the developer seat, and I'm, I chair uh, USGBC Los Angeles, which is, it's. Um, and so the, the thing I just want to explain about LEED is that those of us who are like in the know, um, LEED is just something that's sort of happening in the background, but innovation is, you know, is like not in the scorecard. But LEED is the lingua franca. Investors, again, we get back to old white men, they finally, there's like a something they finally get. Like, don't take it away from them, you know, like, and they reward us for that kind of thing. You know, like investors finally get it. Brokers finally get it. Um, and that allows us a platform to do so much more. Like you try to talk to them about carbon credit, I mean it's like forget it. You know, they don't, they don't, it's like shocking. Um, but they finally get this one thing that allows us to do more. The plaque on the building. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I Susan. To, I know we're yeah. getting pushed out and everyone wants to get to lunch, but instead of I'm not gonna bash lead, I love lead, but the Living Building Challenge is really amazing. It, it's a way of thinking. It's a peripatetic walk down a design and construction path that a team takes. So it, it poses a problem, achieve net zero water. And then the team has to figure out how to get there. It's, there's nothing prescriptive about it. I, 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 that, that is where innovation is maximized. 
And I just want to say, from obviously from a landscape architect standpoint, lean doesn't go far enough for sure. You know, and that's why we have sustainability sites, and it has to go further. Soils are really important. They don't lead doesn't cover it. That's why we had to do something in addition to that. So. Great. I think that's a good place to end. Thank you all for attending, and enjoy lunch. <laughs>